Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is our 269th episode being recorded on September 18th, 2013. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm not entirely sure I'm muted or not, but my name's Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malentano. Nah, we didn't. We never mute anybody. That would not be any fun. We did have one concern that they ask if we clean up the podcast some. I don't know if this is the right episode to start with that request. I don't really think we say anything particularly not when we're, foul. Yeah, not Josh, when we're maybe. Doing the he changes recording. the camera to Josh right then. I don't know if that's on purpose. Oh. But, uh, you, you, you talk about John Holmes once. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, I consider the amount of information per insult or per, you know, inflammatory term pretty high for this podcast over most other ones that I've ever listened to. Uh, most of them just make up their information anyway. We are completely 100% factual most of the time on this show. So uh, if you're just joining us for the first time ever... Welcome. This is the PC Perspective Podcast. Uh, we do this every week sometimes, and uh, we record it live. Hey, at we, least we do it every week. Uh, you, <laughs> no, so much. Sometimes I travel. I got I to gotta get out and about. So pcper.com PC slash podcast is the URL that we uh, have all the links where you can subscribe. Obviously, you're going to want to download this every week. Uh, and then pcper.com slash live is where if you want to see all the pre-show, post-show, all the stuff we cut out of the middle, you can watch us actually record the show live Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Other time zones figured out your damn self. Um, Whoa, hey, hey. There we go. Language. Already with a potty mouth. Oh, yeah. God damn it. F- f- figured out your darn stuff. <laughs> you screwed sentence. that up right away. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's talk about some stuff this week, guys. Uh, Do we have any stuff to talk about? I mean, not, seriously. Not really. No, IDF was last week. Uh, you guys got my news clips from that, right? You got my, my horrible audio videos that I sent in so that you, would, you, had, you wouldn't miss you me that much. You were a sharp dresser, let me I, tell you. I was. You should have watched, watched that, epi- that week's episode of Techzilla. I wore that suit as well. It was sharp. My tie was crooked. I was a little bit... That's true. Yeah. It was, and you know what? The, the one thing that you could do if you're ever going to do that again, mm-hmm. here's a trick. Okay. You take the tails of your blazer, you scoot back and sit on them, and it makes yeah, the know. line on your shoulder... A lot straighter and nicer because you're okay. like this. Yeah, you're was I? I was, so on that, on that, that, you get it, and you have a nice, okay. nice line. Also buy a tie clip. Pro tip. Buy a tie clip. I'm not 95. <laughs> um, the, so, yes, on, on Tuxilla, I was standing, so I couldn't have done that. But when I was recording those videos at the hotel, you're right, I could have. I, th- I feel like I was kind of hunched over the camera because I was using the integrated camera, and it was, it was a bad deal. Anyway, that was last week. We're on to this week. We have a handful of articles that went up. Uh, the first two we'll just kind of touch on briefly. Uh, Corsair released, well, I don't know when they released it, but we posted a review of the Corsair Carbide 330R quiet mid-tower chassis. Uh, Lee did this review for us. It is a, we'll call it a mid-tower case, I guess. You can see clearly by this design. It's a, it's a very clean-looking design. There's no windows. There's no very obvious air intakes, anything like that. You open up that door. You get a little bit of noise, uh, cancella- not cancellation, noise uh, dampening material here on the inside of it. You've got your filters. You've got, uh, it looks like there's one included fan on that. Uh, and, and look at the inside here. You can see kind of how the hard drive layout looks as well as with uh, some components installed. Hey, that's sharp. It's uh, it's a nice, clean design, right? And and it's the thing about cases is it's all about personal preference, right? So if you like lots of lights and LED fans, there's options out there for that. If you want something that's very clean and kind of understated, there are, there are things like this 330R. So Lee did this review. Um, it's got USB 3 front headers. That's nice. Just a pair of them. I know uh, Ken always wants more front panel USB connectors, and I would agree with that because very rarely do I ever go behind the PC anymore. Once I have a PC built and it's sitting at a desk or under a desk, I don't want to have to ever get on the ground and plug something in in the back. Keyboard and I mouse thought we were supposed to keep this podcast a lot I don't nicer. ever want to get on my hands and knees trying to plug something in to the back. Exactly. You're going to get rug burns that of way. Of the PC. Yeah. Right. Uh, so this, but this, sometimes the back of a computer does want to get sniffed. Yeah, sometimes port sniffing is necessary. It's so a lot of hot air Alan blowing out the back of that as well. Alan, Alan is well versed in port sniffing. <laughs> uh, 
so a lot of this case is built around sound dampening material. You can see in this picture that there's on the side panel, on the, on the, on the front panel, uh, on the top there is some of that. And what you can do is if you want to have a higher performing part, system essentially you can take this part off and reveal uh, two places for fans 120s or 140s or you can have uh, integrated water coolers or any kind of radiators you want really in there uh, it's got your typical looks like seven or eight seven i'm going to say external uh, bays you've got a bottom mount filter for the power supply and these rather kind of i don't know they're really tall looking rubber feet that uh, they look kind of a little bit like they would be breakable, but uh, he didn't seem to indicate that there were any problems with that. So um, inside you get a lot of the standard things you get with Corsair cases, like uh, the, the cable routing holes. This is one of the lower end, less expensive cases, so there's no rubber grommeting on them. You still get the big opening for case or, or for CPU cooler swap outs. Um, there is room for another hard drive bay here it looks like if you want to buy it it may be something you have to purchase separately from them but otherwise it's a it's a pretty clean setup in terms of getting your motherboard in there even with a big cooler <laughs> i i don't thank god it's clean i don't i don't know <laughs> i don't know how else i could phrase that so that it is not funny to josh there but, was uh, no way. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there is. You've seen the insides of his cases. They are dirty. He as likes hell. them dirty. They are dirty as hell. Uh, so that's that's a three thirty R. It's a good low cost case. Uh, where's the uh, probably looking ninety nine bucks on Newegg uh, as of August twenty thirteen when he actually uh, finished pinning this. The only minor weakness he found is there are no external hot swap bays on a on a case that cheap. That's really not something you're going to ex expect to see, uh, but Silver Award overall, not too bad. Now, the next article is a very special article to us because we've talked about this motherboard at least one or two times previously. This is the world-famous gank machine. <laughs> oh, you could have slapped that in that case. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, so this is, the EC this is an ECS Z87 motherboard. The exact model number is the Z87H3-A2X Extreme Gank Machine Motherboard. Uh, and Maury posted a review of this. We have done a, a lot of Z87 reviews. You can see just by looking at this overview that there are a lot of features on the board. There really are. Um, you can, got support for three graphics cards. You've got uh, USB. You've got Bluetooth. You've got Wi-Fi. It actually has 802.11 AC as well. They're talking about uh, you know some of their choices for chokes, for uh, MOSFETs, caps, that kind of thing. Um, they, they seem to be more proud of this design in terms of an engineering standpoint, from an engineering standpoint than they have in some of the previous designs, right? So there's lots of specifications there. So if we take a look kind of at the key motherboards, you've got two-way, three-way, uh, two-way SLI and up to three-way crossfire support, 12-phase power design, 100% um, solid cap design. They've got things like the ECS Durathon, Durathon, yeah, that's right. I said Duron or Athlon, but it's Durathon uh, technology. Uh, 15 micron gold contacts. More gold, the better. If we know anything about motherboard design, the more gold, the better. And Apple took that to heart. They sure did. Not champagne, first of all. Uh, dual gigabit LAN, wireless LAN, 802.11ac, and uh, other stuff like that. So Maury's got tons of photos in here of what all the connectivity options are, uh, what the layout is. Look, look at all that gold. So much gold. Bling. Wait, scroll back up. What is in the back plate? What is that strange looking this, thing at the t Oh, that's a Bluetooth or This is uh, Bluetooth I think over here because it's blue. Uh -huh. And this is Wi-Fi and that's the oh, antenna connection that's in the nice. middle there. Yeah. That's That's a nice layout. It's all right. It's all right. They've got a 3-digit LED debug display. Talk about innovation. And look at those buttons. There is a power reset some kind of gear, a uh, man running, and... Yeah, why do you have to run for down. your machine? I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. the NSA comes. <laughs> comes from Rowdy at the man running. Uh, it's got a mini PCIe MSATA port right there as well. So there's actually, there, you know, a lot of interesting features on this. You know, you got your six standard SATA 6G ports on it, courtesy of the Z87 platform. Um, 
And uh, I'm not going to go through any more of this review specifically individually piece by piece, but I would highly suggest you guys check out the review that Mori wrote. Uh, performance was good. Pricing is actually pretty reasonable as well. It is uh, $219 as of this as of when Mori wrote it after a rebate, $20 rebate, uh, which puts it at the almost like the mid-range pricing scheme for enthusiast level motherboards. And he kind of comments in the conclusion that you know, for the amount of features you get, like 802.11n, I'm sorry, I said AC. That is the whole time I said that, and that's wrong. 802.11n, not AC. Um, Three-digit LED display, he comments, the 802.11n Wi-Fi, Bluetooth capabilities, eSATA, mSATA, tons of onboard buttons, as we discussed. And uh, all that for a fairly reasonable price, he does comment. The weaknesses that are the CMOS battery is blocked when using a multi-GPU configuration, I'm really surprised we haven't moved past something else besides those standard uh, CMOS-style batteries. No onboard CMOS reset jumper. Uh, the manual is not that great. Not a surprise for me from an ECS board and unable to control the ring bus speed in the BIOS EFI. So that is the ECS Z87 <sighs> Extreme Gank Machine motherboard. Any, any At least it's not like the Extreme Spank Machine. It's close. That'll be slightly more expensive. Change of color. And and you have really have to have a clean case for that one. For the feature set you get on it, though, I think it's well worth the price. The spank machine. I don't know about the gank machine, but... Josh let me borrow his spank machine once. <laughs> <laughs> it's really awkward. And you still haven't returned it. <laughs> well, it was, it was good. It was a nice product, you know. <laughs> um, let's move on. So uh, the maybe the uh, most interesting story of the week, maybe not, it depends on your point of view, is uh, an article that was long in the making, uh, but rather short in the words in the presentation, as it turned out, uh, because the, the, the issues were kind of very obvious and upfront and just easily discussed. Uh, I published another article in our frame rating series. This one is frame rating, affinity versus surround in single and multi-GPU configurations. Now... The history of frame rating, obviously, if you're listening to this show, you probably know what that is. Uh, we first started talking about what we were going to do with frame rating on January 3rd, 2013, which is this year. Uh, so it's been quite a long time since we started down this road. We started talking about the hardware we were using. We started talking about the software we were using and then what the results actually were, kind of all culminating in a March story that showed all about how multi-GPU configurations can be uh, evaluated in a different way with capture hardware rather than using onboard software like Fraps. So hopefully you guys all know about that. If you don't, I would pause this very podcast right now. Go to PCPer.com, click into the story called Frame Rating, Ifinity versus Surround. And in that first paragraph, you will see links to uh, Frame Rating Dissected, full details on capture-based graphics performance testing. It's a complicated title that simply tells you that you should read this before you read everything else because it really changes how you're going to think about uh, I think graphics performance in general, and then how you read our stories based on this this testing methodology. So, our initial batch of stories always focused on single monitor resolutions very heavily. So, 1920 by 1080 and 2560 by 1440, up to 2560 by 1600. Now, we had included 5760 by 1080 test results a little bit previously, um, but we always had this problem where most of the time, the AMD Crossfire results were very odd. Um, they, the, the scripts that, that we have that, that kind of parse all the data that you see on the screen through the overlay uh, were airing out, glitching out. We didn't know what they were really looking at. And as is most the case when you're in this business is you're always trying to focus on what's the most important, what do we need to get done, what's, you know, we, we need, what do we need to key in here to, to talk to our readers about. And we always focused on single monitor stuff. We were getting good results out of that. We knew how to evaluate that. Uh, those results, etc. Um, now, I'd always plan on going back and looking at Ifinity because its set of problems that you have with Ifinity plus Crossfire is different than the problems you got with just Crossfire on a single panel. So, you know, we, we've discussed all about uh, what runt frames are and how they affect performance, how AMD Crossfire in many cases uh, presented a lot of runt frames and it kind of adversely affected the gaming experience because you were not seeing the observed frame rate that something like Fraps or an in-game benchmark told you you should be seeing. 
Um, this did not happen on NVIDIA's SLI technology. Now, uh, fast forward a couple of months after that, I think it was sometime in April, the 7990 launched, and AMD gave us a prototype driver that said, hey, you know, we, we took a look at your results, we recognize them, and we're going to fix them. And they gave us this prototype driver that in introduced a feature called frame pacing, and it did pretty good. It fixed the results um, that we saw in our testing initially, and they said, uh, sometime in the future, we'll have a full release for you. That happened on August 1st. We got a driver from AMD, released to the public as 13.8 beta, and it introduced the option in the control panel called frame pacing. If you had a crossfire setup, you could enable it. <clears throat> and it drastically improved frame times, improved the smoothness of the animation, and made, uh, I think, a world of difference in how users that had already purchased or were going to purchase Crossfire configurations were able to game at resolutions up to 2560 by 1600. And there are lots of forum posts and lots of discussion talking about what a difference that driver introduction made. Now, when they released that driver, they did say, they admitted up front, hey, this, only if, this is only going to help resolutions 2560 by 1600 and below. Ifinity, uh, DX9, and OpenGL, I believe, were going to come in a future release. Immediately, there were people that were saying it was going to happen by the end of August. When I went to AMD, they said that wasn't the case. It's obviously not the case. We're in mid to late September, and it didn't happen. Um, so fast forward again, and sometime in August, I started compiling results for let's look at Ifinity more directly. Let's see exactly what these, what these differences are. We had uh, changed the way the scripts work so that we could now evaluate the, the specific problems we were seeing. We could now automate how these tests were run and, and what the um, benchmarks and graphs and things and how they reported and it all worked pretty well. And I approached AMD again and said, hey, here's our results. Came to them with a full report of here's our results. Uh, it's different than what we saw before, but it's obviously related. Let's talk about it. What, what, do you, what can you tell me about schedules? What can you tell me about what is different? And they were a little bit hesitant to really kind of offer any constructive thought on it. I, you know, I think internally, really, it was like, well, we can't fix it right now, so there's no point in answering. Maybe it'll all kind of, it'll all kind of blow over. Get to today, or this week. We published a story that looks at Ifinity versus Surround, and obviously the problems that Ifinity has displayed with Crossfire Solutions. Um, <clears throat> before I get into the other stuff, let's, let's just talk about what we actually saw. So, what do you know about Ifinity? Here is a wonderful picture of Josh's home setup using three 1080p panels. Right, Josh? Because, you know, my desk is so clean, like the rest of my office. Well, if you can't tell, I actually cropped that picture quite a bit from the bottom. Oh, I, I know you did. Okay, all right. Just trying to save face a little bit there. And for some reason, I couldn't find an easily accessible picture of my own of a, of a three-way configuration. Regardless. <clears throat> so... This is all spelled out in the article, but I feel the need. There are a lot of people watching here tonight and people that are listening to this podcast that may not read the full article. And I want, I want to point out a couple of things. A 2560 by 1440 screen results in a pixel count of 3.68 million pixels per, per image refresh. Uh, a 5760 by 1080 screen is 6.2 million pixels. That's a 69% increase in pixel count. So obviously the compute difference between even the, almost the largest uh, single panel and going to uh, a, a standard resolution Ifinity is, is pretty dramatic. <clears throat> single GPU configurations, even the Titan, uh, which is the fastest single GPU card out there, struggle doing Ifinity or NVIDIA Surround with a single card. So Crossfire and SLI are very important to people who are investing in multi-display configurations. Uh, that is that is the base assumption I make, and I, I don't think anybody can really dispute that. Um, the problem is, as we mentioned, that the frame pacing fix that AMD has introduced thus far isn't doesn't affect Ifinity at all, and in fact, there are different and somewhat related problems um, using the 13.8. Also interesting to point out is that current 60 hertz 4K monitors, like the ASUS PQ321, with this wonderful image here, and the Sharp, which model number I can never remember, which is based on the same panel, uh, essentially use Ifinity and NVIDIA Surround to produce their image. There's a, when you connect, even though you connect a single DisplayPort connection to your graphics card, inside the monitor is a multi-head MST, multi-stream transport splitter that actually 
has two display heads. So you're actually seeing two 1920 by 2160 displays that in the AMD driver currently you configure as an iFinity um, setup, side-by-side -side monitors, and it works great. In NVIDIA, it takes a little bit more work. There had to be a specific drive to recognize it. It was a pain in the ass, clearly as we showed in our initial PQ321Q kind of unboxing and initial uh, video. Um, that being said, once you get it all set up, it's essentially acting as affinity and surround to the, to the driver, to the game engine. So 4K is affected in the exact same way as affinity is affected. So this is uh, what the terminology that I'm hearing now is SLS, single large surface. So multiple heads that are being combined into one large surface. So SLS, I think it's a great term. We'll move forward. Now, how do we test iFinity? It's a larger resolution than our capture card could test. Aha, aha, but if you've got three 1080p signals, all you have to do from a performance standpoint is intercept one of those signals, left, center, or right. Uh, as long as your overlay works correctly and it produces the color bars on each monitor, which ours does now, you can capture the left or the center. And we choose to capture uh, the center in most cases as it obviously allows us to do more after the fact to evaluate animation smoothness and performance. So the testing methodology is the same. We're still capturing one monitor from an iFinity output and from a surround output and looking at performance and looking for potential errors. Now here's, here's where things get complicated with the iFinity setup is there are three uh, individual concerns, as I call them in the article. One is drop frames. And we've, this is the one we've known about since the beginning. Uh, a drop frame is simply a frame that is rendered by the game engine, sent to the graphics card, but never actually shows up on the screen. So if you look in this pattern here, you see white, blue, blue, teal, teal to green, green to, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say maroon, and maroon to purple. Uh, the problem is, is that the color sequence should go white, lime, blue, red, teal, navy, green, aqua, maroon. So there's, there's a frame missing in between each of those colors. So at some point, a, a drop frame is rendered, but never shown on the screen. Why is that important? Uh, Fraps records that dropped frame as a rendered frame. So your frames per second that you get from Fraps would be higher than what you're actually seeing on the screen. And the, uh, any in-game benchmarks you use would show that frame as well, even though it never actually made it to the screen. So that's important when, when evaluating performance real-world observed performance. Uh, the next issue is maybe more complicated. This is an interleaved frame. And if you see the overlay here on the left-hand side, uh, this is a screenshot from Grid 2. Let me see if I can uh, click here and zoom in on a bigger image. And so what we would normally see is a collection of colors on the left-hand side. Now you see this weird thing where you have uh, fuchsia yellow, fuchsia yellow, fuchsia yellow, when in, in reality, the yellow should be one frame. It should be together. It should not be mixed up like that. Um, we're calling this an interleaved frame. And so even though the frames might be in the right order kind of at this point, now there's a different issue where our, the, the initial problem we had as it turned out with our scripts was they thought that it was dropping 11 frames of our 12 frame sequence every time it went back and forth in that manner. And obviously that's not what was happening. It was a totally different problem. So we found these interleaved frames and it can cause weird graphical glitches. For example, here in Skyrim, click on it, come on. Um, if, we, if, if we look at this image of Skyrim, he says as he, come on website go. Come on website go. Um, if it doesn't load up here, we'll, we'll look here. But you see, of course, uh, the colors on the left will be solid. It will look like, okay, this is actually an order that they could have been in. But if you look in the left-hand side here, look at this, this area right here. You clearly see that there's a slice here, a slice here, one here, one here, and one here. And these one, two, three, four, five slices are kind of intermixed, kind of jumbled. And actually, if you look real closely right here, there's actually a sixth slice that's kind of getting mixed up here. And so this problem is not really just our colored bars. It's actually happening across the entire screen. In this case, this is the left-hand screen being captured in, uh, in Ifinity. Now, these interleaved, fra interleaved frames become a problem in evaluating performance. They become a problem in looking at like, just your overall image quality and what kind of animation smoothness you see. It doesn't happen with, just with the overlay. If you look at this screenshot from Bioshock, you clearly see in the door frame on the middle screen, on the center screen, uh, you get this same kind of interleaving issue. Clearly this part and this little skinny part are supposed to be the same frame 
and this one and this top part are supposed to be the same frame. That's, that's kind of a problem. Uh, and you may also notice on this side that they are, there's only appears to be two frames. Which brings us to our third problem, which is stepped tearing. This is a term that we're just throwing out there. I think this will fix. And what you should notice is, yes, we see this weird interleaving with the white and the white there. But notice that the thickness of this white, this frame that represents the white color bar there, actually gets bigger as it goes across the screen. And again, this is the left-hand screen of an Ifinity configuration. And notice that this green one is actually getting thinner as it goes across. So on the center screen, you're actually seeing you know, different if, if frame you were count. right, uh, I, you know, it, with it going smaller to that size, it would it would appear less problematic. If it were going, if we're getting smaller, going to the right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, uh, and then of course we wanted to showcase that this wasn't just happening with our capture equipment. So we have, you know, we we bought a uh, what did we buy? A GoPro Hero Three Black. That did 120 hertz. Oh, awesome! My laptop is messing up. It is plugged in actually. Um, 120 hertz at 720p, and we're able to, you know, just capture it with the camera. And we saw the same issues show up there, right? So it's not just caused by our equipment. We wanted to kind of get some of these potential um, complaints or issues out of the way. So what's that leave us with? I think it's, it's fairly easy at that point to say that the benchmarks are going to show that uh, AMD Crossfire is showing a much lower perceived frame rate than NVIDIA SLI. SLI did not have these problems. We looked at tons of games. Even though we're only showing you two benchmarks here in our, in our story, we actually looked at eight or ten different games. We saw these same problems occur pretty much across the board um, for AMD, varying between interleaved and dropped frames. And we did not see these issues on NVIDIA SLI. So that's kind of the story as it gets laid out. Running theory of why this is happening is something between either bandwidth or synchronization issues on NVIDIA's, or I'm sorry, on AMD's side, in terms of when a GPU is done, how long it takes that copy to come across the PCI Express bus, and when uh, the primary GPU is actually switching to that incoming frame buffer. And I know, Alan, you and I have talked back and forth about what could be causing it, sync or bandwidth. Um, AMD seems to claim that it's only a sync issue. If that's the case, then they'll be able to address it and fix it. If it's a bandwidth issue, it would be a much more diff difficult problem to address. Yep. Um, and just for clarification, yep. this only affects Crossfire. So if you've got a single AMD card, you do not see these issues in Ifinity. That is that is a hundred percent correct. This only happens with um, Ifinity plus Crossfire. In Ifinity plus Crossfire, exactly. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna. There we go. Ifinity plus Crossfire. So, you know, the, the benchmarks don't look great. We have a video that we posted to our YouTube channel that um, showcases these differences side by side. I'm not going to play it back here over the live stream because it. It won't do any good. You need to go, at the very least, watch the YouTube version. I would highly recommend download. We, we posted a fully downloadable 60, 60 frames per second version of, uh, <clears throat> of the video on our website uh, through, I think, mega.co.nz or whatever, or something like that, to, uh, to download the file. So that being said, and that out of the way, what do you guys think? Anybody have any comments? Uh, you're a noob. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't know how to test. You're a shell. Okay. Yeah, I said and new new comments, new ideas. Oh well. No. Oh, uh, <laughs> VSync will fix it all. Uh, no, uh, incorrect. <laughs> I actually we actually checked that, and oddly enough, when you enable VSync with Ifinity single card or dual card, uh, nothing changes. Like you don't VSync doesn't work in, in Ifinity as far as I can tell, in any in any facet. So. Which is weird. I don't really understand why that's the case, but it is the well, case. Well, it's software controlled, and obviously there's something goofy in their software controlling it. Yes. So um, AMD's response after kind of deciding that I was going to publish this story has been that uh, we already admitted that this was a problem, and we are committed to fixing it. They did not give me a timeline as to when they are fixing it. Um, <laughs> There is a running story or theory that next week it will all be fixed. 
because everybody knows now, everybody knows, according to some people, that AMD is going to have an event in Hawaii next week. And they're going to talk about their next generation GPU. And they're going to talk about 4K. Uh, and that's, that's great. And I, I'm excited about their next generation GPU as well. Potentially, the problem is, is that this doesn't really help people that have already purchased cards, 7,000 series cards, or, or backwards. Um, they, they still tell me that they are committed that they can fix it on the uh, uh, current generation of graphics cards. But I, it, there, there was a lot of, let's say there are some discussion about whether or not I am unfairly kind of piling on AMD with this story and this publication. If you read our comments, most of it uh, on Reddit or on Slashdot or on our site are very positive. Thank you. Uh, AMD has made good strides, but we need people to keep, you know, making sure that their feet are to the fire and that they're, they're working on these things as quick as they can for the largest um, audience of people that they can. And that there are some people that believe that that's not the case, that I am uh, either, you know, obviously some people think that I'm an NVIDIA fanboy, that I'm NVIDIA bias or something to that effect. Um, obviously, that's not the case. I don't know. I, I'll, I can say that all I want, obviously. And so is this where we all kind of chime in with the uh, Top Gear and saying, some say his heart is a tinted shade of green. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Ryan, before PC Perspective, what was the website called? Uh, AMDMB.com. And before that? Oh. AthlonMB.com. And before that? K7M.com. Well, okay. And before that, you were just some guy working in a computer store. Before that, it was just me. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's just my... Not, not it's even all my been space. a facade. So you might say that if He's anybody tried to make an argument... for all these years. If they tried to make an argument either way, it might be that you were more AMD biased if anything well in the past right but now things have changed uh so i'm obviously the other way bias uh oh i don't you know the, the politics of this stuff don't really need to involve the reader and that's the unfortunate part is that a lot of times that's what happens you see maybe you see stories on other websites that say things like uh we read on an outlet that uh amd isn't uh, Ifinity is equated to 4K and that they have, NVIDIA has the better 4K experience. That's clearly not the case because I've been working with 4K for 100 years. And <laughs> it just pisses me off because it's clearly not the case that I'm biased. Um, if, if you knew the inner workings behind the scenes of how often I had gone to AMD and said, hey, let's talk about this. Come up with a statement. Come up with some kind of response. Before the first articles ever went out in January, I was doing that. Before the main article came out in March, I was doing that. Every step along the way, I was trying to get AMD involved because I don't like shitting on anybody. It's not fun. This past three weeks for me has been hell, dealing with all of this crap going back and forth. And it's not fun. But in the end, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to publish the results when you have them as an independent media journalist our commitment is to our readers in this case our viewers and our listeners and not to any one company and or to any and company you know you're all. you're not the first to have gone down this path because remember last year around this time scott came out with the first uh kind of you know the, the fraps the frame pacing yep. and he showed extreme problems with like the 7950 and some of the cut down cards yep and AMD came out and was like, well, we don't know about this. And then finally it was like, yeah, there's a problem. And then they said, hey, we, we changed around some, some uh, things in our driver with uh, memory uh, you know, access, and it smoothed everything out. And certainly that helps single cards yeah. immensely. This is just building upon that problem. And, and trust me, like I, I, have, I have had my doubts about whether or not they'll be able to fix it in Ifinity. They assure me that they can. And so I'm going to trust them in believing that, right? The difference is now they, they gave us a date before July 31st. They missed it by one day, close enough. They have not given us a date going forward on this. Uh, I think it's a much more difficult problem, and they're just, you know, I want them to fix it. And I don't just want them to fix it on the next series of cards. That's, you know, obviously I want it to be fixed there, but I don't want it to only be fixed there. I don't think it simply uh, erases the history that they have with 7,000, 6,000 and beyond. Um, 
the other thing that, that has going around in that other story was that this is somehow this article was pushed and promoted by an NVIDIA marketing like PR campaign, you know, where they kind of come to media and say, hey, look at all this crappy stuff. Make sure you write about it, right? Because AMD's launch is right around the corner. And uh, while I can't speak for every other media outlet, I can tell you for 100% certainty that I had all of this data before NVIDIA did. I had all this testing capability on Ifinity and on 4K that I didn't show well before NVIDIA did, well before they approached anybody, well before they couldn't capture 4K before. I had it all figured out. I was already talking with AMD at that point. And there was a lot of delaying, installing tactics about, eh, maybe we can try this, maybe we can try this, um, trying to get us to just kind of not publish. And I finally decided that that's not, that's not the road I want to go. I want to be honest. I want to be honest with them. I want to be honest with NVIDIA. I want to be honest with Intel. And I want to be honest with uh, everybody that listens to the show and reads the words that are on our page. Because at the end of the day, if we lose um, you know, sponsors and supporters, that really sucks. But... What sucks more is losing your readers, right? You can't sell advertising and marketing to an audience that doesn't exist. I mean, I guess you could try. Eventually, you get fo uh, found well, out. Well, you know, there, there are some people who have attempted that for short periods of time, and we're successful. Well, and I'm not a millionaire yet, so obviously I haven't figured out that part of the game. So I just think that uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of crap that we've gone around the last couple of days. I think a lot of it about me personally and it pisses me off. And I don't know how many people listen to this tonight or tomorrow when it goes out, but I want everybody that listens to it to know that it's all bull crap and that we are doing this here for you guys. Trust me, when Alan wrote that article about how crappy Intel SSDs were years ago, they were not we happy. We they, made no friends. They were not happy people. <laughs> but you know what they never did? Cut off contact. They never, uh, like, you know, said you need to take that down because this is this is BS. They they fessed up, they fixed it, they moved on, right? And that's what we want AMD to do. And that's what they are. To be fair, that's what they are in the process of doing. I just felt I I think that nobody had had looked at Ifinity plus Crossfire this specifically. Wanted to make sure that was out there. And as they update it, as they fix it, we will be here to report on that. If I don't report that they fixed it and they fixed it, then come back to me and tell me I'm biased. Don't come back and don't tell me that now because I'm reporting a problem as we see it. The data is there. The data is honest. <laughs> and it wasn't provided by NVIDIA in any shape, form, or fashion. And, and certainly going into this, uh, this is something I experienced myself. Uh, that pic first picture you showed was uh, when I was excitedly showing everybody uh, that I finally got an Ifinity setup. And I cross-fired two 6970s. And I was, you know, really stoked about it, and, and I'd play games, and it was okay, but, you know, the frame rates were really, really good from what I was able to record. Um, but then I, I got two uh, GTX 580s in, and I put those in SLI, and I was like, wow, it's, it's really buttery smooth. What's, what's wrong with this? So I, I put back in the, the, the two 6970s, and... It just was kind of weird. It it just wasn't, you know, a, a pleasant experience. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't pleasant. And then I thought, well, let's do more testing in here. So I disabled one of the cards and still did Ifinity. And even though the frame rate plummeted, it actually felt a little... A little what? It's Are you there? A little smoother. Hello? You cut out at a Hi. little smoother. You yeah, crossfired it was, uh, there for a minute. You know, it was it was smoother, even though it was slower frames per second, supposedly. And this was further exacerbated when I put in a single seventy nine seventy, and like a game like Oblivion, which had all kinds of stutters in some cities, suddenly just smoothed out, even though the frame rate was a little less than what the crossfire products did. And so yeah. as a consumer, I would want to know about these things because this has a visceral, substantive impact on your experience in a game. And so if you buy two $300 cards expecting a certain amount of performance and experience, 
and you're only getting the same experience as if you had a single card in there, that's something consumers need to know. I agree. I agree. And I think I think most people agree with that. I, I mean, obviously, as as a company at AMD, you hate seeing negative press about any of your products. I totally I totally understand that, and I, I and I understand the the desire to not have that coverage up there. But uh, at the end at the end of the day, we all believe here uh, that it's the right decision to publish that story. And several outside entities that I took advice from in this matter believed it was the right thing to do as well, and that it was not simply a piling on operation. Um, as well. So that's going to be. And besides, look at all the time we spend talking about AMD lately. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no advertising is bad advertising. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily well, the case. To an extent. Um, but I, I'm going to leave it at that. So we've, we've talked about this topic quite a bit on the podcast. We have some other things we're going to try to run through in terms of news for the week because other things did happen. It wasn't all about this uh, uh, this week, even at our. Website. So if you want to read that story, I would encourage you to do so. It's on the homepage, pcper.com. Look for the story. It says frame rating, affinity versus surround, and single and multi-GPU configurations. I think it is a well uh, thought out and kind of detailed explanation of what's going on, why we think it matters, and why we think uh, it's important to, to tell you about it. If you have any comments, leave them on that article or leave them in this podcast post on the website, and I'll reply to them, even if you're trolls. And Ken tells me to not. Um, One last thing yeah. I'd like to say. Sure. I think that this can be fixed to an extent with current hardware. Okay. Now, when saying to a certain extent, it's not going to be a perfect fix. It's not going to give you the frames that are being rendered on each card as they are. So let's say we're getting 80 frames per second on this high affinity setup. But, of course, you've got the runts. You've got the strange little wedges in there yeah and so it's not a good thing nope well i think that they'll probably get to the point that they can fix it in software because there are some things that are just plain software controlled uh such as refresh across three monitors is entirely software issue. controlled yeah. it's not hardware and and in nvidia it's it's hardware i guess with their latest generation cards not with the what 5800 and well the 580 and below um so you're probably going to see a fix, but you're not going to get that same high frames per second. They're going to probably have to lower that. So it's going to be greater than a single card, but it's not going to be the theoretical maximum that you can get with two cards, even with you know 5 10% uh, decrease that you typically get with a multi-GPU situation. You're probably going to get 25 to 30% increase with a second card. It's not great, but it will be a fix. You will have a better experience, but I think that there are just simply some hardware things that they need to improve upon in their chips that you simply cannot work around. Yeah, we'll see. Um, the the running theory is that we'll find out next week. Uh, we won't have. I don't. I know for a fact we will not have an answer next week because if they were going to have an answer next week, they would have told me this. Um, but we will probably have. Uh, maybe a pathway to the answer to this. A roadmap, as, if as you will. As uh, oddly said as, uh, said as that. So, okay, let's talk about some news items. We're going to run through a bunch of these uh, so we don't keep everybody on the show for three and a half hours. I think we talked about this before, about EVGA launching the Mini-ITX Hadron air case. So this is a Mini-ITX chassis that includes a power supply uh, from EVGA. Uh, at our QuakeCon event, it was affectionately called the Hardon. Instead of the Hadron, crowds are great that way. Um, yeah. It has, we have one of these in the office right now. We, we started playing with it earlier this week. Uh, we'll have a review on this fairly shortly, so we don't want to spend much time on it. But my one concern, the one thing we haven't decided on yet, is it has a 1U power supply in it. And most of the time in the previous many ITX designs that have used a 1U power supply, the noise of that single fan, what size is that fan? It's got to be 40 mil. 40, 40 mil. Okay. There, the sound of it can be off-putting, we'll say. And uh, we'll, we'll see if that turns out to be the case. But there are some neat features on the on the design. It's got uh, room for a water cooler in there. It's uh, I think it's a 500-watt power supply that's integrated. For an iOS, two USB 3.0 ports, two audio jacks. 
Um, it's got room for it. I like the fact that the slot loading optical bay is on the side. I don't have a picture of that, but the slot loading is not on the front, so it doesn't ruin the way the, the case looks at the front. It's kind of cool. Um, so what was the price on that? $189. What do you guys think? Is that, is that pretty steep or is that decent considering you get the power supply and stuff in it? Well, it's 500 watt power supply. So yeah, I mean, that's probably even more than the case is. Yeah. Power supply is great, but how easy is it to replace that one or find a similar spec replacement? The, the power supply? Yeah. Um, I mean, it looks like a standard 1U power supply. Okay. In there. Uh, so I don't know if you'd be able to buy a replacement from EVGA or what the warranty is on it. Looks like I don't see that listed here. Um, but. Uh, it makes sense if it was just a standard 1U server rack. Yeah, and it's, it's at the bottom of the system. It kind of looks like, can you agree? It's just like it was standard mounted, just kind of on the bottom though. It's, we'll, we'll take a look at that in, a, in an article in the upcoming days or so. Uh, does anybody here use a Chromebook? No, you like nope. real computers? I don't, is that the joke? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, so at IDF, we're still finishing out the last couple of announcements from IDF. They did announce, uh, Google and Intel announced Haswell powered Chromebooks. Uh, result in increased performance along with two times the battery life of previous generation. They're talking about uh, between eight and nine and a half hours of battery life. Uh, we're probably, we're obviously talking about the dual core, low power variants of Haswell. Systems will range in price, but some of them will be under, starting at under $300 for like an 11.6 inch, 2.76 pound Chromebook. Does this sound appealing to anybody? So that's a Haswell x86 yeah. chip? Mm -hmm. Running Chrome OS. Yeah. yeah I mean, claiming so eight close. to nine and a half hours of battery life. That's so close to being so much more capable. I just, I don't know. Right. So, the, <laughs> yeah, I guess the, you would just say, why not just get a, a Haswell notebook with Windows on it? Or right. any other operating system, really, at that point? I, I'd agree with you. But the, the key here is that they expect systems to be under 300 bucks. And, uh, you know, the whole promise of Chrome OS is that, hey, you do all your crap on the internet anyway, why not just be on the internet all the time? It's not, the, it's not a solution for everybody all the time, but uh, it, I think it's a pretty interesting product. And NSA approved. <laughs> there were a ton of people asking for, on that, I remember on that, last, on that second day keynote, they were like, oh, when's Intel going to announce the new Chromebooks? When's Google coming out to announce the new Chromebooks? And I was like, I don't know, guys. I didn't know you were that excited about it. But they were. Apparently they were. So... Uh, and which, what's the Chromebook called that has the uh, 2560, the pixel? It's 2880. 2880 by something resolution display. I, always, I remember when that came out, I thought, maybe I should just buy that and see if I can put Windows on it. It's the unobtainium version? Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of Haswell and Intel, you guys want new NUCs? I got one right here. Look, it's a NUC. Only if you can go NUC, 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 NUC. You, you can. I don't recommend it. This is, uh, this is the Haswell-powered Intel Nook. Um, it's a little bit, little bit shorter. Same dimensions, 4x4. Four four. Uh, it has, doesn't have Thunderbolt. It has mini DisplayPort. It has mini HDMI. It has gigabit Ethernet and two USB 3.0 ports. So your connectivity options change quite a bit with this. It also has an uh, IR receiver on the front and two more USB 3.0 ports. IR Nook. You are Ryan. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's that's great. This is a, again a dual core Haswell part. Uh, we are, I think we've actually finished running benchmarks on it. I just need to kind of compile it and write up the story on it. But it's a pretty impressive little device. Um, competing Not now. Not so melty as the last one. No, it has. We didn't have any issues with performance at all, or uh, overheating and crashing, Weird. or anything this time. Hey, you know it. They they admitted it and they fixed it. That's all we can ask, right? Yeah. Uh, so now it's competing against things like the Gigabyte Bricks, which is a kind of similarly sized computer. They announced Haswell versions of that. They announced Iris Pro versions of that at IDF as well. You can see this picture of the, uh, the, the Nook board in here, 4 inch by 4 inch with Haswell on here. Uh, I like the, the package design here. I think that's, I think that's nifty. Yeah. So again, front I/O, USB three, analog audio, infrared receiver. Wait a minute. This this is the uh, Haswell, right? Yep. So this is the Iris. Uh, no. Yeah. No. How no. is that not Iris? With uh, the HD five thousand. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, remember there? Remember when Haswell came out? There are HD four thousand and HD five thousand series of integrated graphics that do not have Iris or Iris Pro. It's the same. Yeah. Ken Ken's saying that he thinks it's the same processor as his MacBook Air, the uh, i five forty two fifty U. So, it does sound vaguely familiar. Uh, we'll have a review up of that soon, but maybe more interesting. I'll be. I'll ask you this, guys. Do would you? Are you more interested in the Haswell Nook? Uh, I don't have a price on it. Let's say three hundred bucks. I don't know. I'm it's just... going to be more. You think so? Well, yeah. how about? Would you be interested in a Bay Trail M powered Intel Nook for one hundred and forty dollars? Sure. That's it. That's anybody. Nothing. Yes. Alan, you like little, yeah. you like computers, right? Damn it! Somebody say something. <laughs> okay, let me let me. The, here's the problem I have with Bay Trail. Okay. Do you like my hands coming out? They're great because it's a problem. 3D monitors. Yeah. Uh, I/O. Kind yeah, of it's not so good on this one. It? On what the Bay Trail one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it has USB three. It has one USB three point port, two USB two point ports. Headphones, uh, gigabit Ethernet, HDMI, and a DC power jack. I'm, I'm talking, it, it's no na- there is no native storage? SATA or PCIe support. That is correct. That is correct. The storage, well, no. It says in the specifications, one SATA data port plus custom 5-volt SATA power port with 2.5-inch hard drive kit. So, okay. Uh Bay Trail M may be slightly different in that it does support a SATA port, or they've included a third-party controller. I think it's a third-party controller to that uh, backbone. I can't remember what they call it, but there's a, a basic the controller I/O. hub thing. Yeah, yeah, that they have. On You're right that, because so. the Bay Trail does not have native SATA support. It has no. It's, it's some strange SD controller, right? Well, it has eMMC, which I think is the primary storage controller they'll use. For Bay Trail, and it's meant yeah. for tablets and you know that kind of stuff. Uh, Alan, what kind of speeds could eMMC actually get? Is it reasonable? The sequential is pretty decent. It's the random access where it kind of takes a hit because it's not very multi-channel type of architecture, right? It's basically like one uh, okay. flash chip. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting, but 140 bucks. Yeah. Now, now it's interesting. Um, and th- what was the price of the uh, Asus T100? Talked about less. Three fifty. Was it three fifty or two fifty? No, no three fifty or four hundred. Three forty nine, three twenty nine, something like that. So, you're starting to see the price levels that Intel's getting down into with Bay Trail. Remember, they talked about IDF getting into a hundred dollar tablet by Christmas. So Ken says it'll never happen. Knight Rider says SD 3.0 and EMMC 4.51. SD 3.0? Yeah. Primary S- switching fabric. Yeah. SD 3.0. What's SD 3.0? What am I missing? SD card. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought we were abbreviating something else. Yeah, and it has USB, mm. integrated na- uh, native USB support. As well. Yeah, and so AMD, USB even though it's like double that, to right? triple the, uh, the 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 TDP, it has pretty much all that stuff all integrated on it. Yeah, Alan, could you use a USB three controller as your primary storage? You can as long as the uh, as long as the BIOS supports booting from it, which is something as new as that should. I mean, performance wise, will that would that I mean that's still is it better or worse than eMMC? Is it something that you know they wouldn't uh, well, use either I mean, way? You, USB 3 should out- outpace eMMC, like, anyway, as long as the controller and whatever you connected to it is, is decent enough. Um, especially if it has flash memory in it. Uh, is it the USB 3 version that supports that? Uh, what's that four-letter abbreviation? The one that supports command queuing over USB. OMFG? U-A-S-P? Mm. Oh. U-A-S-P. Yeah, what, R- what Ryan said. Yeah. Does it support that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, thought that probably, was kind of an, an Intel Asus chipset, as so media it's, only thing so far. Oh. Yeah, it was uh, it was an Asus exclusive feature, I think, at some point for a while, but I don't I, I haven't really heard anything else about it. So Well I will say if it if it turns out it somehow supports that, be it with a future driver or an update or something like that, then it'll it it sort of approaches serial ATA. Okay. At that interesting. Point. All right. 
we'll keep yeah. we'll, we'll keep a lookout. That's going to be in Q1 of 2014. Uh, Alan, what do you think about this Mushkin Scorpion Deluxe PCI Express SSD? It's got all the great keywords: uh, Scorpion Deluxe PCIe and SSD. Uh, the only thing they're missing is uh, Death Wish Raid. <laughs> well, if you put that in the title of the of the product, I think maybe that's going to be viewed as a negative. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's uh, it actually looks to be a decent product, especially cost per gig wise on the high end, right? Because if you look at their two terabyte model, it's just over a dollar a gig, huh. which is pretty good for a PCI Express solid state driver, regardless of the architecture that they used. Sure, um, you know that's that's pretty darn low. Um, so this is supposed to be. Uh, you know, current generation Sandforce, I know that they keep using that 2281 number. I wish they would sort of ratchet that up a little bit, you know, denoting that it's been revised since then. Um, however, it is, you know, it, it should be relatively problem-free uh, as long as you're okay with a PCI Express, you know, type of RAID solution with, uh, you know, several SSDs behind it, several right. SSD controllers behind it. Um, the, the rating, I'm a little concerned because the, the, the specs, I say it's spec'd a little over 100K IOPS. Well, it only takes a couple of those Sandforce controllers to hit that. So if it's more than two, uh, you know, it sort of led, leads you to believe that the, con the RAID controller or whatever that implementation is the bottleneck as far as raw IOS per second, which is part of the reason that you'd want to get one of these in the first place is that you want like blazingly fast, you know, random access. Yeah type stuff um and I, I hate to say it but you can easily hit over 100k or over 100,000 4k random you know ios per second with multiple insert any almost any name here ssds regular two and a half inch ssds behind any any modern chipset in raid so. in like software chipset raid so yeah it's kind of like i don't know and you would actually pay less cost per gig for that as well, right. potentially, you know, if you want with it's say, not Samsung. called. It wouldn't be. And you can boot Scorpion. from it too. Yeah, is this bootable? Do you know anything about that? Uh, this should be bootable. It does. It is not. We didn't. We didn't write it in our thing. But no, Tim mentioned it's, straight it's, off. It is not bootable. Seriously, it is not bootable. It's this is bootable. what they're saying. Mm. Which in this day and age almost is a surprise mm. because almost all of them are bootable now, except yeah. Fusion IO. Wow. Mm. Yeah, and the Intel nine ten. Uh, but <laughs> if you use software RAID, if you use controller RAID, it's not called Scorpion. That's true. I mean, you can and put a sticker on the machine and say Scorpion Storage inside, I guess. Go ahead and do that. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Might this be it was the, like, this could it be an was, interesting product for us who it's are funny doing because it was, lots of captures? Was, I think it was over 100 podcasts ago where I put four <laughs> X25Ms in a RAID oh, and on the podcast right. showed IOMeter at close to 200,000 iOS per Ken second. says it was way over 100 episodes ago. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's like two way. years. That's two years of podcasts. Yeah, was, yeah, episode 80 was probably around this time wow. that you're talking about. We, we had an episode 80? We did. Oh, oh Lord. Try not I to think, think I joined it. up in 37? And like then, 1937? Uh, so and it's all gone downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me. Ken has said he has edited 200 episodes. Ken, Ken actually, in our backroom chat the other day, Ken uh, busted out my comment in, what was it, Podcast 38? Yeah, Alan wrote in an email to us at Podcast 38. Oh, I emailed, yeah. You wrote in an email to our podcast, and you had, like, your big, like, Navy signature at the end of it with, like, this. 18 different characters. And it was this guy. <laughs> Was that what it was? <laughs> the photo fast. And you were CR9000. Like, you're like, if you want any more information, let me know. I can probably bang a few things out. Blah blah blah. I was like, who is this guy? What who a nut this job. Guy? Jeez. He's some Jeez. nuclear reactor engineer. I used to be. I'm a, a nuclear engineer on a sub. La di da. Yeah, that was blah, blah, episode blah, 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 blah. 38. So that's 230 episodes ago. Yeah. <sighs> 230. Mm -hmm. 30, no, 31. We have That's wasted a, a lot of time. Long time, and we used to not do them every week. So, <laughs> for a while there. So there's a big long span of time. All right, let's move on. Uh, people show DDR4 at IDF. I don't know what else to tell you. G Skill showed okay. some. Kingston showed some. Um, That's cool. They wouldn't tell us what platform it was running on. They were showing DDR4. Granted, not running on a platform at CES. Oh. Really? Okay. Yeah, but those wrote, are like engineering sample, non-working right. DIMMs. 
Yeah. So this is G Scale showed off um, DDR4 DIMMs clocked at 2.1 gigahertz at 4 gig capacities. Uh, it probably has well E. I don't think anybody actually verified it because they're not allowed to, according to Intel. I believe, I'm trying to figure how many gigabytes Kingston was showing in their demo. It was a lot of gigabytes, like 192 gigs of memory running on a mystery platform um, that had DDR4 on it. So uh, DDR4 is coming. You don't need to worry about buying it now, thankfully. Uh, and if, if all memory successions have been uh, the same and we expect this to be the same, expect DDR4 to be more expensive and slower when it's first released than the top end DDR3 at the time. Also at IDF, we're still on here, uh, Thunderbolt 2 was shown, 20 gigabit per second products. Um, this is useful for when 10 gigabits is not enough for all the rating and video capturing and mobile storaging that you need to do and displaying on high resolution screens. Uh, they had a lot of stuff. There are Z87 motherboards shown with Thunderbolt 2. These are from Gigabyte actually, uh, Asus and Azrock, all three of them, I lied. Uh, so they all, these all have support for the new 20 gigabit per second Thunderbolt. Um, I'm becoming less and less excited about Thunderbolt as fewer and fewer devices are released using it. But you know, what can you say? Um, so there's some e details there on Thunderbolt 2, as it is being called, uh, from Promise. Yeah, the, yeah. What, what, what did we call that in Final Fantasy 14? This is Thunderbolt, a realm reborn. <laughs> Uh, for whatever purpose that has. Is is Ken squeaking in the background? A little bit. He certainly a little is. Bit. Speaking of Ken, he published a little story on the website this week. Ken, way to publish. Just Turn delivered the Ducky Channel Zero DK2108S mechanical keyboard. I had never heard of this device before. Neither he, he brought it in. Uh, it has a funny logo. This is a duck, apparently. This is a duck with, like, an antenna that glows. I don't know. It's Taiwanese, right? That's yeah. just... Ducky. So they use the uh, uh, cherry, cherry blue. Uh, blue keys. I thought I thought They're we were going to show pornographic uh, material on uh, the podcast. Oh yeah, down and up. Uh -huh. well, this is instructional video. Yeah, if it's educational, you're allowed to show it on TV. That's if I learned anything, it's that's what it is. Uh, Work the shaft. You can see the keyboard here. It's what a hundred bucks, Ken. 120. One twenty. He really likes it. It's really loud. It's like the loudest cherry keys you can get. Is that right? Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, it does light up. You can see here in the photo. It does have uh, all the keys light up. Other keyboard manufacturers take note. Every single key has a backlight. Uh, it is mechanical. Every key is mechanical? Okay, so there's no scissors on the uh, like page up, page down, number num keys, anything like that. Okay. And you can see it comes with a ducky-shaped key removal tool. You know. For, for reasons, right? So uh, if if you're interested scroll in... All scroll all the way down. Oh, I'm NVIDIA bias. Oh, you're an NVIDIA bias fanboy, oh. you piece of crap. Fanboy. Did they pay you to put those keys on? No, but they did give those keys out at QuakeCon. And because it's backlit, it actually looks kind of cool. It does. Uh, but, oh, they also come with a keychain. Look at that. It comes with a, with a, with a Cherry Duck. MX Blue key keychain. Man, what an odd product. How much is this thing? 120 bucks, I think. Wow, those those uh those keys are coming down in price. Apparently. Right. That's so that's less that's inexpensive. Well, compared to like you know that's why I used to have keyboards that didn't have them all being cherry switches. I do like this comment uh, on at the end of the story that's from Mlock there who says one of us, one of us, one of us. He's in the cult of the cherry switches now. Apparently. So uh, if you're interested in that, check out Ken's thoughts there. Let's talk about AMD a little bit more. Uh, they have now confirmed that Hawaii, the next GPU. God, I hope they play that the entire time at the tech When you get to Hawaii. I'm going to bring a portable speaker system in that fanny pack <laughs> that I got at the AMD Seattle uh, AFDS, and I'm going to play that theme song over and over again as I walk around. And then they'll tell me that I'm NVIDIA bias for sure, right? Because Hawaii 5 Just make sure you don't stand too near to water in an AMD rep while you're there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm going to turn the GPS on my phone, keep it in my pocket, so I'm always, somebody always knows where I am. Uh, so AMD confirms the Hawaii GPU will use 28 nanometer process. This is an interview uh, that Matt Skinner did, AMD's Matt Skinner, on Forbes.com. 
who says that uh, another thing I can tell you is about the process node. The GPU is going to be 28 nanometer. Some have speculated that it was 20 nanometer, and it's not for a specific reason. At 28 nanometer for an enthusiast GPU, we can achieve higher clock speeds and higher absolute performance. Uh, he also commented on the price target. Um, he says they're coming in Q4. I can't reveal a price point, but we're looking at more traditional enthusiast GPU price points. We're not targeting the $999 single GPU solution like our competition because we believe not a lot of people have $999. I think that is an accurate statement. Uh, we normally address this, uh, address what we call the ultra enthusiast segment with a dual GPU offering like the 7990. So this next generation line is targeting more of the enthusiast market versus the ultra enthusiast one. And then in terms of die size, he claims it's very efficient. NVIDIA's Kepler GK110 is nearly 30% bigger from a die size point of view than Hawaii. We believe we have the best performance for die size in the enthusiast GPU market. Um, other than that, nothing really interesting came out of the interview. Josh, what do you think about those comments? Lots of things. Okay, good. Okay, first of all, yeah, one, nobody's doing mass production of 20 nanometer stuff. So is that maybe why they're doing... The specific reason they're doing 28 nanometer? There's another reason as well. All right. Uh, so Intel is the only person doing 22 nanometer, but to get good results, they're doing that thing called Trigate. And getting Trigate, or in the non-Intel world, FinFET, to work... I love that word. ...is an expensive proposition. Right. And so if they were to go to 22 or 20 nanometer planar type transistors, you would get the decreased aerial density but your transistor switching speed would not be great you would not see any real improvement and your power is going to be pretty grim if you say you know take a a big design you know three billion transistors or whatnot and try to run that at one gigahertz and you compare that to a 28 nanometer hk metal gate and a 20 nanometer hk metal gate you might actually be pulling more power in the 20 nanometer just because the physics are just not there for what you're trying to do. Um, people are getting around that at 20 nanometers by using more exotic materials such as uh, FDSOI, fully depleted SOI, which still is not readily available. But you, uh, you get good results with that without having to go Trigate or, or FinFET. But nobody in the world has got 20 nanometer FDSOI running. So even though theoretically you can get 20 nanometer stuff out, and guys like the SSD guys uh, doing the, the NAND, mm -hmm. they're at like 19 nanometer. Um, it's not the same. It's I mean, you, you've got different uh, power envelopes and uh, switching speeds that cannot be addressed without going into this, this 3D topology in transistors without FDSOI. And so, yeah, AMD is absolutely correct in that if we want a faster chip, we may need to stay at, at 28 nanometers because we can clock it up higher and uh, it's going to be less expensive to do it that way even if we have a bigger die because once we go down to 20 nanometer, we've got a whole slew of problems that we're going to be having just because of the physical characteristics of planar transistors at at these geometries. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I, what do you expect out of Hawaii at this point? Um, you know, I expect quite a bit. Uh, this is going to be GCN 2.0, essentially. Lovely um, weather. What? Lovely weather. Yes. Lovely. But... Uh, I think that uh, okay. Let's let's go back a space and say when when Nvidia released the GTX 680, they said we've got the most efficient, power efficient, and performant product on the market. But then when we really started to compare it to the Gigahertz Edition 7970, what did you see in terms of performance and power? In in compared to. Well, the 680 and the 7970 gigahertz. So the 7970 used more power. But how much more? I mean, because I, I, in later stages, when I would do A-B testing, the differences were minimal. 
Um, if I, they if weren't you, great. I mean, it wasn't like, you yeah, know, oh, this I mean, is another was, 70 watts. It was more like 15 to 20. Right. I was max. thinking 20 to 30 watts, right? So it's, it's, it's not enough that, you know, I ever didn't recommend the 7970 as a single GPU option. Uh, but it was enough that, like, hey, there's a difference here, and it's worth pointing out architecturally. Yeah, but then when you compare and contrast their their GP GPU stuff, uh, it was no comparison. The no. AMD product with GCN was overall faster yep. when those type of applications, and I mean that was that was easily seen through a multitude of applications because that was something that that NVIDIA moved away from with this uh, generation of, of products, and they really wanted to accentuate gaming and power and. AMD did a pretty good job in, in having a well-rounded product that competed well. Sure, it pulled in a little bit more power, but not a whole lot. I think with GCN 2.0, we're going to see AMD has, has really optimized this. So hmm. they're going to have a smaller die size in Titan, but I think they're going to have very, very comparable performance overall because Titan is kind of an old product as compared to this, and certainly what NVIDIA has done, I think that they're focusing uh, perhaps next year when 20 nanometer uh, is going to be more accessible and we may have more interesting materials to work with and potentially uh, some FinFET type uh, uh, technology Im implemented into these. Uh, because, what, the 780 is just a, a cut down Titan. Right. 770 is just a, a slightly faster GTX 680. Yep. And so GK 104, GK 110, these are all going to be the same. I think AMD is, is going to make a larger chip than obviously the 7970. It's going to be faster. It's going to be more optimized. Uh, the design's going to be better. And I think it's, it's, it, I don't know if it's going to be faster than a Titan, but I think it's going to be very similar. I think it's going to be faster in GTX 780. If it's think, if it's similar to a Titan, but they're sticking to the 699 price point. If, well, I'm or, hoping they even go below that, right? If if uh, 650. Yeah, I'm hoping th 399. Obviously, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But 499, I've seen 599 to 650. Yeah, is what some of the rumors that I've seen, and they would be dumb not to do that. I I think so, especially with these statements that they're coming out with already, right? That they're 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 going to make a product that more people can buy than Nvidia is currently making, right? For their yeah. for their high end flagship parts. So yeah, and it's a smaller die, and plus they've also got another product below that. It'll be a Hawaii that is cut down, and you're going to oh. see that one for the four fifty to four ninety nine dollar. Because how much can you get a seventy nine seventy today for? Three sixty nine, I think. 369, then that's the gigahertz edition. Yep. If you get a non gigahertz edition, you're looking at 299 after some what? specials. Just kidding. I yeah. I mean, it's, it's nuts. It's a <laughs> lot of power for not a whole lot of money. Not a whole lot of bucks. Nope. So AMD may have kind of a little bit of an upper hand after Hawaii. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see where NVIDIA. Yeah. The, the, Trust me, I don't know anything more than other people know about Hawaii product at this point. Um, but I'll be very curious, right? So these new products are going to come out. NVIDIA is not very close to a new series of products based on everything that we know. And is it going to be very similar to what it was at the beginning, wow, the beginning of 2012 where the 7970 came out and then it was how many months until we saw the refresh from NVIDIA? Four? Four months from the 7970 yeah. to the GTX 680. Okay, and and I but wonder, there was a nice price war during that time. Right, and I, and I think AMD uh, could could force Nvidia's hand in a lot of ways that in that direction too, right? So, um, which which is fine, right? Price battles are great. If if AMD comes out with a better product that's higher performance again, like they did two years ago, awesome as well, right? And you know, single GPU performance is going to be much better i assume and hopefully they'll fix the multi gpu issues and then we can all move on and be happy together about the world of graphics cards and things will get much easier because benchmarking things won't be so crazily complex because shit just works well that's what we thought for the last five years too so it's all about being vigilant hence your steam name <laughs> <laughs>
v- mm-hmm. Vigile Village. Yeah. Yes, yeah, village. Village. All right, our last news story uh, comes from NVIDIA and their announcement of the Tegra Note platform. This is a interesting twist, actually. So there had been rumors going around for a while about the NVIDIA Tegra tab, and NVIDIA was going to get into the tablet market like they were getting into the mobile gaming market with Shield, right? And, and that they were going to release a, a tablet themselves based on Tegra 4. Well, it's not quite like that. It's almost like that. It's essentially like that. But instead of taking all the glory for themselves with S.H.I.E.L.D., they're going to spread some love to their partners that were really pissed off about their focus on S.H.I.E.L.D. instead of their focus on graphics cards. So uh, the Tegra Note tablet platform is exactly what it sounds like. It's a platform that NVIDIA has built, essentially a reference design for tablets. Uh, They are then going to allow other partners to resell under their brand. But they're all going to be basically identical. $199 for a Tegra 4 mobile processor. We all know about that. 72 core GeForce GPU, GeForce in quotes. That's a 7 inch tablet with a 1280 by 800 screen. Not the best screen, not a, not a great resolution there, um, considering what you see like in the Nexus 7 uh, and some other the 7 inch versions like the uh, iPad mini. The iPad mini is higher than that too, right? Yeah. No, it's 1280 by 800. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, it's got a rear camera, front camera, 16 or 16 gigs of storage, expandable to 32 gig. Um, Expandable 32 gigs more with micro SD. Uh, front facing stereo speakers. Yes. Yes. Front facing speakers. Um, micro HDMI connector. 100% Android. Uh, has a stylus. Over the air software updates from NVIDIA, and they're claiming 10 hours of HD video playback. Now, it's 199 bucks. It's going to be sold in North America by EVGA and PNY. So you're going to get an EVGA or PNY tablet. What do you guys think about that? Can you get it at the uh, Hipster Troll Car Wash with Robert Downey Jr.? It's got two speakers in the front, man. I don't, I don't get it. Have you never seen those commercials? I don't get it. Alan? The, the HTC. <sighs> the HTC commercials? Yes, with Robert Downey Jr. Hipster Troll Car Wash. Oh, I saw. The only one I saw was the. Um, Humongous catamaran. tinfoil catamaran. <laughs> yeah, the humongous tinfoil catamaran. What's HTC sta- HTC stand for? Harung- humongous tinfoil catamaran. That's the only one I've seen. Now I get what you're saying. Uh, okay. Sorry. Well, let's let's rewind that. Ken, let's edit it um, to right after <laughs> he says the, right right, right till after he says the joke, and I'll go. <laughs> you're right, Josh. Now I um, totally get that. <laughs> totally. It's kind of odd to think about PNY and EVGA selling tablets. It really is, but I don't. Don't be. I wouldn't be worried about that. Everything's going to be made by NVIDIA. This entire process is being controlled by them. I think there's going to be very little differentiation between these two products and between any of the products from region to region. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think this is interesting. I think the idea of a $200 tablet based on Tiger 4 with the stylus. Uh, I did get more information. It's a battery capacity of 4,100 milliamp hours and a device weight of 320 grams. That's a little bit heavier it's about 10 percent heavier than the uh the new nexus 7 and uh, it's a little bit thicker than the new nexus 7 as well by a millimeter 9.6 millimeters thick versus 8.6 millimeters thick but 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 it's not open gl es 3.0 compliant uh yes 32 bit oh god it's, and it's only 32 bit how am i gonna play my infinity blade 3 on this this product i don't know you're not. I don't. That's don't the care. answer. I, yeah. Well, it's running the wrong OS, so probably. Not. Yeah, it's not an <laughs> yeah. iOS device, so it doesn't even really matter what this is. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited about this. I think it could be cool. Um, how much does the shield cost? Two ninety nine. I don't know, like a million dollars. It's not like a million dollars. It's two ninety nine, right? So this is a hundred bucks less than that. You know, now you can get a Tegra Four device for less than that, and I, I like the idea of it being kind of like a reference design. Because if they can only make they the would product. enable streaming on the device they're selling indirectly and uses their chip. You mean game streaming? Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, but you don't have a controller hooked up to it. You nobody, could. nobody wants to use touch controls on that. I, I don't know. I think it's a pretty interesting cool. product. It's going to be available uh, next month. I think mid to late next month from these different vendors. So uh, it'll be interesting. Will it be able to compete with the Nexus Seven? Because the new Nexus Seven is an awesome piece of hardware. Um. But it doesn't have front-facing speakers, guys. I don't know what to say. I'm excited about the front-facing speakers because of the humongous tenfold catamarans 
front facing mm -hmm. speakers are pretty great. So that's why I bought an S4. I couldn't get an HTC One, damn it, Ken. Uh, so let's move on and finally finish up this damn show uh, to our hardware software picks of the week. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about uh, the AMD FX series of processors, the release of that 200, 200 something watt version, the FX9590, the fact that it was very expensive and then not expensive, but still very expensive in the US. Um, we were told by AMD that, yeah, it's going to be cheaper in a certain ways, but we're not lowering the price. It was very confusing. The end result for the consumer is now, uh, in this combo on Newegg, you can get an AMD FX9590, which is the 4.7 gigahertz turbo up to 5 gigahertz part, an ASRock 990FX Extreme 9 motherboard, which is a high-end, good quality motherboard, a Corsair Hydro H60, which is a little bit older in terms of the um, self-contained water coolers, but if they're including it in the combo, I'm going to assume that it's capable of cooling this part, and an HIS Radeon HD 7850 2 gigabyte card. So you get all of that, the processor, the motherboard, the cooler, and the graphics card for $664. Throw in a case and an SSD, and that's it, right? Am I forgetting anything? Memory. Power supply. Memory. Power supply. Memory. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> the only those two things. So memory, that's power supply, memory. case, SSD. and SSD. That's like half of the components of a computer. Optical drive. Th that's practically <laughs> nothing. Nobody uses an optical drive. Um, <laughs> for 664 bucks, It's actually <clears throat> like a compelling... Don't get all choked up about it. It's really... It's getting me good. Like, <clears throat> I think... It's not somebody's horrific. trying to force choke me or something. Because really, it comes out to be about two hundred fifty bucks for the uh, the processor, two hundred to three hundred bucks. Really, that's even cheaper than I thought it was going to be. Actually, yeah, you're right because the the board is one hundred eighty, uh, the graphics card is one hundred thirty five. That makes what three ten plus seventy dollars for the cooler. We're up to three eighty. So if you take that out, of the, yeah, okay, that's kind of interesting. I think. Um, building a system around that would be a very interesting like scenario to test. I don't think I'm going to spend six hundred sixty-four dollars necessarily to test it. But if you're buying from scratch, it's mm -hmm. not horrific. No, no, know what you're getting into. Know that it's a high wattage part. It's not going to run very cool all the time, maybe ever. But uh, it should be fairly high performance. And I don't think you can get a good quality motherboard that graphics card. A 3770 or 4770K from Intel uh, in a cooler no. for that price, no. right? I mean, the processors themselves are 330, 50, 350. Yep. Um, yeah, so yeah, no. I, I think it's interesting. I think I think it's a good it's a good deal. They're doing good things. I'm, I'm sure they didn't want to have to sell them for that cheap, but they are, and that's that's what matters. Jeremy, what's your pick? Well, a couple of people at work have been asking me if what my recommendation on an external hard drive is. And these are the type of people whose phones tend to look like they were dragged behind a car for a very long period of time. Mm. So Jeff over at the Tech Report actually just put out a very perfectly timed review of the Data Dash Drive Durable Series, which is a 500 gig drive on special right now on Newegg for 50 bucks. Did you just say Dash Drive Durable? Yes. So you need a cardboard tube in an orifice. <laughs> but to it's get the waterproof, full... Josh. It won't mind. And you can wash it after. And, and if, if you've been doing your Kegel exercises, it is shockproof. Oh, Christ. We went there. I wasn't even paying attention. And all, I hear that. I listen, See what happens oh, when you look away? God, I got to. Right, but hey, a 500 gig external drive second. for 50 bucks. Not bad. Yeah. The fact that it's going to live through a lot of what you would do to it even better. <laughs> or at least what Josh would do to it. Oh, Extreme environments. <laughs> What's the humidity like in these environments? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Lord. the USB cable is extendable so you don't even have to take it out. Hey, uh, I don't have links for Josh or Alan in my show notes here. I put links in. Should, I don't you know why. Refresh your Google oh, Drive. yeah, I had an internet issue. Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, internet issues. It's the worst feeling. Okay. Uh, anyway, so we'll say that now. Moving on. Um, oops. God damn it. Go ahead, Josh. What do you got? Uh, you know what? Funny, we're talking about those 7970 gigahertz edition. You can get the Sapphire with a good cooler mm -hmm. for 339 after all the rebates. All of Three, the one rebates. 359.99 before <laughs> the uh, $20 
gift card, uh, yeah. and you get the the three games with it. So that's you that's, know even after Hawaii comes out, this is going to be kind of the area where we're going to see the seventy nine seventies, and it's still going to be a very good buy. It does look like that cooler is like a, a it's like a three slot cooler though, right? Like it looks like it yeah, extends it's just enough past it. So I will say, in my completely unbiased opinion, that at, unpaid at three hundred thirty nine bucks, that's Forty to sixty dollars less than a seven seventy, a GTX seven seventy, and I still believe that the seventy nine seventy gigahertz edition is better in single card configurations. It's it's a better performing part if you're not going to do crossfire. Um, so that's still it's still a good investment. And plus, you get three free games with purchase. Limited offer. They did add Saints Row four to that. That's that. That's the most recent game they've added to their bundle. Yep. Saints Row four. So if you like giant purple phallic bats. Is that in Saints Row 4 or just 3? Probably. It's probably in 4 too. Okay. All right. All right. I thought that was a new Arkham game. <laughs> that is also has giant purple phallic bats. In it. bats. Get it. Yeah, I see what you went there. All right. Uh, Alan. Alan, I'm, before, before you start saying your pick, I believe we have seen this before. Not as a pick. Okay. Well, okay. Go ahead. Because, because I wasn't holding it in my hot little <gasps> hands before. Lights. Ooh. Lights. Gosh. Pretty lights. Is that an All article right. in progress? It is. I am taking a What's look the at date? this It's September 18th. Doohickey. Okay. Yep. And uh, if you pop it open, what? there's a hard drive in it. What? No way. All right. So um, spiffy little device. I love you, uh, Tickadoke. Connects via gigabit. All right. Actually, uh, to your router. Or, this is the you know, transporter. This is the Drobo Transporter 2.0. It's not... Well, it's sort of Drobo, I guess. Well, that? it says it right there. Is yeah. it Drobo-esque? It's Drobo-esque. Are they not using it's that brand? The, why is there a Drobo icon up there, actually? It's made by Connected Data. Well, apparently... Pseudo-Drobo. Yeah, it's sort of Drobo. Uh, well, the guys that spun off from Drobo made this. All right, so... <laughs> they didn't spin yeah. off very far. <laughs> the idea here is... <laughs> Drobo a, uh, brought them back in. Yes. The idea here is a Dropbox type thing where you control where the stuff is stored for what is available over the internet and you control how much capacity you have. So instead of paying for a Dropbox account for however many gigabytes or whatever, you just stick a two and a half inch drive mm. in this thing of whatever capacity you want it to be, basically. Gotcha. Whatever, you know, whatever you can afford to stick in there. Um, the device itself looks relatively cheap, right? It's like 170 bucks. Um, not too bad. How, the um, device is how much again? I think it's 170. 170 What's without it's a drive. On Newegg. Okay. Yeah, 169. Okay. Uh, there are some negative reviews on Newegg, but mm-hmm. they step back to either when the 1.0 version of the software was out, which is it was actually they were having some issues they were working through, mm-hmm. um, or there was a guy on there that said something about like every time I close the app, my my share goes away. And after having looked at this myself. Uh, the default is that everything is just stored on the drive on the transporter and is available to whatever system is connected to it via the desktop app that you install on your, on your machine, right? So there's an app that's available for Mac or PC or whatnot, right? And you, um, you install this app and it gives you a, similar to Dropbox, gives you a folder that shows up in your, in your shortcuts. Mm-hmm. Right? But it doesn't actually copy those items to the local system? Well, here's the thing. Any, any file that's on the transporter drive itself will show up whether you're at your house or even if you're somewhere else. It actually logs in via the transporter, like their right. site, right? and in sort of a reverse lookup method, connects your system through even through your router at home, behind a NAT router, to the transporter, right? So, Which is kind of cool, right? Yeah. So the files will show up. Now, you can still do a Dropbox-style thing if you want, you just have to create a shared folder on the transporter and stick your stuff in there, and that will do the regular sync thing to the you know, respective shared folder on your PC. Right? So just because you install the desktop app on this doesn't necessarily mean that it copies everything that's on the transporter to your local no, machine. No, it, it does not. It only does that with the folders you create that are like... That you specify to act folders. in that behavior. Say again? That you specify it to act in that yeah. behavior. So yeah, if I created a folder say, I called... To be this way. If and I created a folder is, that said Josh's favorite porn and he wanted it to be synced between his home, his office, and his laptop... Can, can yes. you share that with me? 
I wanted you to share it with me. It's what I was called Josh's favorite. Book. Oh, okay. And he would create that folder, copy things from his desktop to that shared folder, and then it would percolate out to those other computers. That's funny you say percolate. Anybody who had mounted that porn, yes. Anyone who had mounted that porn. Do you like hamsters? Porn. No. Okay, so anyway, so the reason that they want to do it this way makes a lot of sense, actually, because your mobile devices that would have this app installed yes. on it don't necessarily have, like, a terabyte or two. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. Right? So, yeah. uh, you know, imagine Dropbox where you had a terabyte of storage. That would actually be kind of crappy because all, all your mobile devices would have, you know, a terabyte in their Dropbox. Well, I have, so I have Dropbox on Android, and it does what the transporter is doing, essentially. I can access it um, through the network. It doesn't store everything yes. locally, but it's accessing it on Drobo's servers, not on my local transporter. Right, right. Gotcha. And it's actually kind of cool what the Windows version of that app does for the files that are only sitting on the transporter because it just makes it look as if they were all in your, on your local system. Okay. They just all show That's up. That's an interesting with, program. Right, yeah, with the directory structure and everything. But they do all go away if you close the app or, or if you're, if you're off the not network. connected. Right. Yeah, if, we're, if you're not connected to the network. So that seems to uh, make sense. It's interesting. Uh, I'm still toying around with it. The, there, were, I, there were some previous. What do you I, think about the lack of like raid support? Like, well, no redundancy. Okay, there is a way to do redundancy with this, which is actually hook even up a cooler U than raid. Hook up a USB drive and it mirrors it. No. Oh, all right. Nope, not even that. Uh, first of all, you will have a mirror for whatever shared. You're going to have it mirrored, right? Alan, watch yes. out. There's somebody behind you. It's, it's going to be Yes, I know. It's going to be on <laughs> It's going to be on every other machine that's yes. on that shared Correct. folder, right? Correct. Uh the other cool thing you can do is now realize with the desktop software it works similar to Dropbox where you can pick and choose which shared folders you want mirrored to mm -hmm. your machine. Mm -hmm. So you could say, okay, everything on this transporter is on this share. It's it's all, you know, a, a, a share. Every all the contents of it is shared, right? Um, now that the sort of, uh, I, I sort of hinted at this when we talked about it, like, oh, it was a while ago. Yep. It was like easily six months ago, but you can buy a second one of these, stick a drive in it, mirror it. Like if you connect both of them to your account, it, they'll mirror to each other. Yeah. Right. Okay. And they'll do this in the background. Yeah. And you could, you can make a share for say all the family photos that you want to share with, you know, grandma or whatever. Right. Yeah. And but then that's 170 thing, bucks plus another drive. Right, but here's the thing. You, now, for that 170 bucks plus another drive, you take that once it's you know synced locally at your place. You've controlled everything you want with it, and everything's all synced across. And you have two copies. You take it, you stick it back in the box, you ship it to grandma, right? And she <laughs> plugs it into her router. You now have an offsite backup. Not only that, but she's got all kinds of hamster videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know if Josh would want to send his to his grandma. Don't send it to your grandma. grandma. Joy. No grandma sending. <laughs> That's an interesting. Okay, we'll we'll leave it at that because you're gonna write up an article on this, and we can yes. talk about the pros and cons of it going forward. Uh, and um, there are some other companies that are coming out with interesting products, similarly Sim specked out uh, in the not too distant is future as well. The dam dancing hamsters, as Web Dude says in the chat. Um, so that's going to bring our lengthy episode, 269th episode of the PC Perspective Podcast, to a conclusion. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. Uh, if you watch this live, awesome, thanks. If you want to be reminded of when you can watch us live, if you go to PCPer.com and you go to this side panel right over here where it has our PC Perspective upcoming events, you can see here's the, uh, the show we're recording right now. It says, we are live. Join us here. You can click there. It takes you to your live page. However, you click this link, to get notified when we go live, it takes you to this page where you put in your name and your email, you subscribe to our list, I send you an email before we go live, before we do anything cool. Like I can tell you, like maybe next week, I guess AMD already said this, right? Yeah. There's going to be a live stream uh, about AMD's new product releases on the 25th, is that right? It's one day next week, and we will be live blogging or covering or streaming or something that event. So we'll put that on the schedule. We will notify you when we're about to go live, and you can participate in our chat and participate in uh, the live blog or live stream, whatever we happen to do, for all those upcoming events. So PCPer.com, uh, look on the right-hand side for the Get Notified When We Go Live button. Click it, and you'll be awesomer. PCPer.com. And if you'd like us to shill for you, inquire about our reasonable rates. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, it's really only food and, um, like, beverages Beer. is all it takes. Yeah. 
Josh likes beer. Uh, Jeremy likes whiskey. Scotch, particularly. Alan likes um, cheesecake, filling. cheesecake filling. He can't buy it anymore locally. And so oil. if you can find it, it'd actually be a big support for us. And I drink a lot of Diet Coke. So we're, I'm, I'm probably the most reasonable person <laughs> out of the four, which maybe explains a lot. You never know. Uh, PCPer.com slash podcast is where you can subscribe to us. YouTube.com slash PCPer if you want to subscribe to all of our other videos is where we post the uh, video recording of this uh i guess that's it we will see you next week in some form or another uh thank you again for everybody for hanging out and uh listening to the show we'll be back next week guys i'm ryan Schrout. i'm jeremy hellstrom i'm josh walrath and i'm alan malentano bye <laughs>